follow the drinking goat for the old man say follow the drinking goat left foot pig foot going on follow the drinking goat i've read a lot of historians who say blacks didn't know direction all they had to do was look at the, at the big dipper it's one of the tragedies of this nation that so much black history and tradition has been lost or gone unrecognized. Most people don't realize what a rich contribution blacks have made to all areas of our common heritage. One man who did recognize this, however, was born in the small town of Goliad in South Texas in 1896. His name was J. Mason Brewer. He was a collector, author, poet, historian, and teacher who was called America's most distinguished black folklorist. His roots in Texas were strong. His ancestors had fought for Texas independence, and his grandfathers were wagoners before the railroads came. At one time, his father had ridden the cattle trails to Kansas. From all of these, he heard stories of the early days of the state. His mother was a school teacher for over 50 years and five of her six children became teachers. His sister, Stella, became an important scholar in her own right. Brewer formed an early interest in stories and tales. His mother had a deep appreciation for Negro history and literature, and in their home library there were books on Negro history and the works of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, which Mason read as soon as he was able. When young Mason was seven years old, his family moved to Austin. While times were strict in the early 1900s, his horizons were broadened by living in the city. He had a chance to hear such black leaders of the day as W.E.B. Du Bois and Joseph Douglas, the grandson of Frederick Douglass. Times were not far removed from slavery, and in his father's barber shop, he heard stories and tales from the surrounding countryside. He began to develop a good ear for listening. In 1917, he graduated from college with a degree in languages, and after spending a short time in France in World War I, Brewer became a school teacher in Fort Worth. His early reading of Dunbar had stimulated his poetic talents, and he privately published a collection of poems entitled Echoes of Thought. A man can be what he wants to be if he'll only pay the price. He must be willing to suffer some and make a sacrifice. He can soar as high as he wants to soar if he thinks it can be done. If he believes and is confident, then half the race is run. A second volume soon followed. Like Dunbar's works, portions are in dialect. At times, the writing is purposefully humorous. You can talk about your Cadillacs and your Hudson's super fine. You can mention how they engines and they motors all are shine. You can speak about the body and the beauty of its frame. But me and my old tin Lizzie has you besters just the same. She'll take me to the city if it's raining or it's dry. Tain't a mud hole that will stall her, cause her mottoes do or die. You can treat her like you want, makes no difference what you've done. With a piece of wire kindling you can fix her so she'll run. In 1924, Brewer returned to Austin to teach English in Houston College. Mason Brewer was a good teacher. He had both energy and dedication to motivate his students. Furthermore, he loved his subject. Wherever he went, he started clubs in creative writing or history. He was always into something. And the concern was always with students bettering themselves. Austin historian and author Mrs. Ada Simon remembers. He always wanted every individual in the class to feel as if he could be a master and he encouraged them to do things, especially in history and in language. He, he wanted them to write, he wanted them to record, and he wanted them to exhibit talent. He encouraged them to talk, encouraged them to say what they were thinking, because he felt that there was a lot of good thinking and a lot of good thoughts and a lot of good information that they were holding back because they were not articulate and he wanted them to be able to express themselves but he he didn't teach only in his classroom he was the kind of teacher who taught wherever you were 
as I said, if he met a child, he'd say, what's your name, you know. But he immediately, by the, the way in which he related to this child, he'd make him feel important. You know, what you're what you going to be when you grow up? was one of his maybe second or third questions on that. He was always proud and he communicated this to people he worked with. Any time he was going to be here for any length of time, he started a project of some kind that would be of a historical or heritage nature. He would find everybody, encourage everybody to let him have pictures of them to tell them about, tell him about themselves. He wanted pictures of where they live, pictures of the place where they work. This was one way of making people feel important. This was one way of making people feel proud. While teaching in Austin, Brewer met Mr. J. Frank Doby. Doby is generally recognized as the Dean of Southwestern Literature and the father of Southwestern folklore. Brewer showed Doby a collection of slave tales that he'd been gathering over the past several years, often working in the fields or listening at gathering places. The compilation of tales entitled Juneteenth became the featured section in the Texas Folklore Society's 1932 publication. Juneteenth is the word used by Texas Negroes to designate the day on which the Negroes in the state of Texas were actually free. And of course, uh, it shortens June the 19th, and they uh, don't mention uh, June the 19th, they simply say Juneteenth, and are either we're going to have a 19th of June celebration. I suppose you're aware of the fact that each of the southern states where slaves were held, each one has a separate emancipation date. Brewer was himself well-educated and spoke four languages. He appreciated Negro dialect and realized that it was just as important a literary form as, for example, white mountain speech or Cajun dialect. He followed Juneteenth with a book of poems entitled Negrito, Negro Dialect Poems of the Southwest. In it, he describes the washerwoman, for example. She washed for a living. The neighbors call her a fool, but that am how her children all finished up in school. At age 37, Brewer published an article on Negro proverbs taken from ex-slaves and elderly Negroes of Texas and Louisiana. He explained that you might as well die with the chills as with the fever meant you might as well get killed trying to escape as to remain alive and die in slavery. In the 1930s, while teaching foreign languages in Dallas, Brewer realized that no one had documented the contributions of black politicians to Texas. Post-Civil War legislatures have historically been portrayed as being made up largely of lackeys and black stereotypes. In an attempt to show the contributions of blacks, Brewer wrote Negro Legislators of Texas. He pointed out that the earliest black legislators of Texas averaged 37 years of age and included farmers, teachers, skilled artisans, and ministers. 25% of them had attended college. 37 years later, Brewer revised the book to include the first black representatives elected to the Texas legislature in 77 years. Among these was one of his former students the Reverend Zan Holmes, Jr. Well, it was a first because it captured the history and the contributions of black legislators in Texas prior to any other book that I know about as such. And um, it also deals with a lot of the issues uh, that prevented black people from serving in the legislature, some of the problems that they had, and uh, lifted up the um, contributions that they not only made to, to black people, but for example, uh, you know, a black man was responsible for the incorporation of the city of Galveston. I mean, they, I mean, they helped to pass laws that benefited all Texans. And um, that kind of information, you know, in our day and time is, is very, very important information. It reveals the fact that the historians goofed. 
um, that um, black history was overlooked. These, this was during the days of segregation, discrimination, racism. And so our contributions were considered unimportant, except when I, where our history was distorted and we were presented in very unfavorable images. Brewer returned to Houston College, but during the 1940s taught for a year in South Carolina. Always active, he published a monograph titled Humorous Folk Tales of the South Carolina Negro. Returning to Austin, he continued to collect, write, and teach, and he published another article in a small volume of poetry titled More Truth Than Poetry. Brewer's fame began to grow, but most of his recognition was related to his classroom and public speaking activities. He was a stimulating lecturer with an obvious pride in black tradition and in the vitality of black folklore as a cultural force. Now in his 50s, Brewer returned to school as a student. He received a master's degree in English and folklore from Indiana University. His thesis, a collection of black preacher tales from East Texas, was published by the University of Texas Press under the title, The Word on the Brazos. The Brazos River flows down through the eastern side of central Texas. The first capital of Texas was located on the river called Washington on the Brazos, and the wide, rich bottomlands of the Brazos River was the location of the first slavery plantations in Texas. The word refers to religion, often brought by traveling preachers. Word on the Brazos was praised by those who recognized its value as folklore, literature, and social history but it wasn't praised by everyone. Brewer had long been criticized because he collected and wrote largely in dialect. Much of the criticism came from those who felt that dialect and folklore itself often uh, signified a return to the past in the image of Uncle Tom. The criticism bothered Brewer, but never stopped him. Regarding dialect, he replied, it is frowned upon by quite a few people who do not have uh, imagination enough and uh, who are not cultured enough, I would say. I think that they haven't taken time to realize the picturesqueness of dialect speech and uh, the wisdom that is encouraged in it and the beauty that uh, these dialect expressions have. Critics overlooked the fact that Dunbar and others had written in dialect, and of course publishers considered dialect taboo. Frank Wardlaw was head of the University of Texas Press when Word on the Brazos was published. We published it because they were wonderful stories and because they uh, uh, preserved uh, a way of life that uh, was fast vanishing from the country and uh, because we, we felt that it uh, was a real service uh, uh, to scholarship. It was received quite well. Uh, one or two bad reviews in folklore journals uh, from the people that Frank Dover described as, as the tape recorder folklorists. Uh, Dover said, whenever I hear a good story, I do my best to improve on it when I pass it on, which the tellers of folk tales have always done. Uh, Brewer uh, worked as a field hand, you know, for several summers in the Brazos Bottoms, and sat around on the porches of the uh, cabins at night and listened to the people talk. He had no tape recorder, but uh, he would uh, uh, write these things down and he would tell them all in his own style. His telling of the tales was equally important, though. He was an excellent storyteller, a natural storyteller. Teacher and artist Dr. John Biggers recalls accompanying Brewer in his collecting. He was uh, a superb a person in getting people to tell him stories. This was his key. This is why he was such a fine collector. And he easily met strangers, and he made strangers uh, open up and talk. But he would tell them stories, and always this guy had the sensitivity to, to know the kind of stories to tell to the right people. And, and that required a great deal of uh, understanding. 
and he, uh, by telling stories himself, he would get people to participate. And when they would participate, um, this is this is when he would really collect. He had and then he had this marvelous memory, because everything they said, as we would get in the car and go to the next place, he would retell it <laughs> and retell it exactly as they did, and then add his own color to it. You see, so. This was a sort of remarkable experience to have with this man because of his unusual ability. And also, he could play a guitar and a harp. And this is also the way he attracted, he attracted attention. He, he was a performer. Again, it was always, this man would walk up any place where people were sitting on a porch, where men were in a field. He'd stop a man plowing, you see. But he had something always to say that would interest people. To me, he contributed a love of self and a love and respect for what you are and where you came from. I think at a time when people were wanting to discard dialect, wanted to frown on dialect, he was bringing it up front like some of our famous writers and helping people see that this was a language that this was a language to be proud of. It was the way people communicated with each other. And sometimes he would tell tales in a humorous way to show that dialect didn't mean that the people were ignorant. It just meant that they had not had an opportunity to study standard English, but that they were really intelligent people and that, uh, that they could fantasize and yet they could be factual and that their language did not interfere with the way in which they told a story about their lives. Brewer not only collected folklore, he helped create it. He did this both through his enthusiastic manner of telling stories and in print. In 1954, he created Aunt Dicey, a God-fearing, snuff-dipping, feisty lady from Dime Box, Texas. Dime Box, Texas is supposed to be named after Aunt Dusty. There was a black family that moved into Lee County, and formerly the mother had been able to get her snuff each week, but there was no store in Lee County near on the plantation where they lived. And so she would whip her children and nag her husband because she couldn't get her snuff. But finally, one Saturday, she saw the mailman coming, and she said, oh, I'm going to ask him if he'll bring me a dime box of snuff. So she ran down and asked him, and he said he'd be glad to. And every Saturday she went down there and gave the mailman a dime, and he'd bring a dime box of snuff on Monday. But first of all, the place was called Dime Box of Snuff, Texas. But then they shortened it to Dime Box. Aunt Dicey was illustrated by John Biggers, now chairperson of the art department at Texas Southern University in Houston. Uh, Aunt Dicey is a matriarch. She's typical, strong character. Uh, Jim Mason Brewer uh, created her. But she's a composite, I would say, of many, many uh, uh, matriarchal uh, black women. And uh, she dominated the family life. And uh, Mason told a number of stories that dealt with her uh, dipping snuff. That was uh, the drop of snuff, uh, dealing with her making bread and whether or not that drop was going to drop in the bread. That was <laughs> she was spitting all the time. And uh, it's, it represents a typical character uh, that, that I knew during my uh, childhood. This is, this is a, a concept of Aunt Dicey that I produced in sculpture. And uh, she was such a fascinating character, I made it in sculpture. Most of, of the illustrations were drawings, however. But uh, she, she offered a great deal, and she was a person who was, uh, she was somewhat of a comedian. You know, she had a dominant character, she joked with everybody, and sometimes you didn't know when she was joking, you know. So uh, she, she was a very colorful person, as uh, this kind of woman is. Uh, they're commanding, they're jovial, they lead, they lead people. They command people. Her husband had a pretty hard time, but he had to make that adjustment because she was a dominant character, you know? 
Dr. Briggers also illustrated Brewer's next work, Dog, Ghost, and Other Folk Tales. In it, Brewer returned to the dialect he had abandoned in Ain't Dicey. Dr. James Byrd is professor of English and black literature at East Texas State University. He was a close personal friend of Brewer and is author of the monograph, J. Mason Brewer, Negro Folklorist. The dog ghost is a large white ghost that looks like a dog with large flaming eyes. It acts like other ghosts, except it's almost always a friendly ghost, usually coming back to help relatives or friends. I guess a good example would be the story set in Greenville in which a young mother dies and leaves two children. Just before she dies, she finishes a quilt and puts it on the children's bed. Well, within a few months, the husband had married the local school teacher, and she takes the new quilt and puts it on the bed of the newlyweds. Well, during the night, a large white dog appears and pulls the quilt off the newlyweds bed and puts it on the bed with the children. This goes on for three nights and after that the new bride sees the dog ghost and never moves the quilt again. Dog ghosts are benevolent spirits. Dog do ghosts, uh, they aid man, they help man. Uh, as, as the dog has been a true friend and servant to man, his ghost is also the same. And uh, not only do you find uh, the dog ghosts, or the benevolent spirits of the dog, uh, in Afro-American folklore, but you find it in Africa, you find it in uh, uh, internationally. Uh, we all know about dog days, and uh, from the classical point of view, the, the, the uh, god Anubis was the dog. And the dog has always been a part of man's culture. And uh, Nubis, you know, was the great embalmer. He took man's spirit. Uh, he participated in man's spirit uh, getting to eternity. He led him through the underworld. So dog ghost is a, is a is, you know, th this is a classical concept. In 1959, Brewer joined the faculty of Livingstone College in North Carolina. He remained there for 10 years. Now in his early 60s and with an honorary doctorate of literature, his name was known in folklore circles and in black communities where he had lived. Brewer's collecting in North Carolina yielded yet another work, Worser Days and Better Times. It contains stories, rhymes, superstitions, and sayings such as, don't make love by the garden gate. Love is blind, but the neighbors ain't. By now it was the 1960s, and the search for black identity had become more militant. Consequently, Mason Brewer's work was ignored. When Dr. James Byrd had begun his search for significant Texas Negro writers, the name J. Mason Brewer immediately surfaced. Byrd corresponded with Brewer and was instrumental in his coming to East Texas State University in 1969. Prior to returning to Texas, however, Brewer put the finishing touches on his last work, a major anthology entitled American Negro Folklore. Dr. Bird recalls Brewer's work in teaching. Brewer was an excellent teacher as well as public speaker. He had large classes, was very popular with both black and white students, and was much in demand as a speaker. Unfortunately, the man grew as he grew older and was less able to move around the country. But he was most entertaining whether you were sitting with him in a car or whether he was on a stage before 2,000 people. The students really loved him. Well, his contribution was not in the field of poetry, which he wrote at first, but in the field of folklore, which he collected. For example, he collected more tales than any black folklorist ever, and he published more tales. He only had one competitor, and that was Zora Neale Hurston, and he outlived her by far. He was simply the most important black folklorist in the United States history. Brewer loved his subject and he was more than just a collector. He was a scholar and an educator. By explaining his subject, he moved it beyond the realm of just sheer entertainment. We have some uh, religious institutions that are not shared by whites. And I guess the most typical one is the prayer tree. 
and this institution came into existence during the slavery period because the slaves were not permitted to pray out loud in their cabins and so they would go down into the woods and pick out a tree and get underneath it and pray and so the prayer tree became a religious, a black religious institution. I recall one that got down one night and he said, Oh Lord, please kill all the white folks and save all the black folks. Well, the master's son overheard him, told his father about it, and the next evening, the master got a bag full of rocks and went up in the tree where the old man prayed and waited for him. And when he came down and started saying, Lord, kill all the white folks and save all the black folks. The master dropped some rocks on his head and he looked up there and said, wait a minute there, Lord. Say, what's the matter with you? Say, don't you know a black man from a white man? <laughs> the prayer tree. Many people believe that animal tales, Burr Rabbit, for instance, are the only form of black folklore. There are many forms, however, and Brewer collected them all. Riddles, for example. What the darkest night you ever done see? The darkest night I ever done see a raindrop knock to the doorstep and ask for light to see how to hit the ground. <laughs> Folklore is more than quaint sayings, however. It's social history and it reflects the people and the times in which they lived. One theme is the relationship of the people to their lands, and a good example is the Rich Saul stories. Two boys were seated on the gates of their father's farms boasting about the richness of their soil. One said, you know last night my father drove a nail into the ground and woke up this morning and there was a crowbar in its place. The other one said, shucks, that ain't nothing. Soil on my daddy's farm is richer than that. My daddy planned to row a popcorn before the mule could get back to the turn row. Popcorn had grown up, popped all over the turn row, and the mule thought it was snow and laid down and froze to death. Religion is another theme in black folklore. It appears in forms other than the traditional spirituals. Our father, which art in him, white man owe me eleven dollars and pay me seven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If I hadn't took that, I wouldn't have gotten up. I've got religion way up the street. I even got religion in my feet. I went to the river to be baptized, stepped on a root, and I got capsized. The river was deep and the preacher was weak, so the black man went to heaven from the bottom of the creek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the church very definitely played a role in folklore. Uh, Bruce's work had a lot of religious overtones in it. Many of the images that Brewer used in his work are religious images. As a matter of fact, many of the stories, many of the tales were tales that had to do with the religious life of black people. Also, I find a very close relationship between Brewer's folklore and the Negro spiritual, the double meanings where the uh, spiritual as well as Brewer's folklore uh, may be saying one thing to one audience, but the real, they're saying another thing to the audience for whom those uh, spirituals were written and, and for whom the, the folklore is being told. And, and that audience readily understands that hidden meaning because this, is, this was a way of survival, really, for black people, for example, in slavery and even in days beyond slavery. Uh, during the days of rigid segregation which followed slavery. Not all black folklore is humorous. Oh, the laughter may be there, but if we listen closely, we might learn something more, something about black pride and identity. One time there were two little boys who lived near railroad track, two little black boys, and the train fascinated them. And the way the engineer ran the trains fascinated them. So one day one of them turned to the other and said, You know, I sure wish I was white. And the other little boy said, How come? He said, So I could run that train. And the other little boy turned to him and said, Shook and say, I run it black as I is. Pride.
The central issue in black experience is oppression. Mason Brewer was a believer in the dignity and strength of black people and in their struggle. Always the teacher. He didn't live in the past, but exhorted his classes and audiences to be proud of their tradition. He recalls one Reconstruction era incident in the South Carolina legislature. So there was a tall black senator who was a member of the South Carolina Senate and a prejudiced white senator by the name of Ben Tillman. Well, Ben Tillman was absent once or twice, and so when he came back, his friends told him this black senator had made some uncomplimentary remarks about it. So Ben Tillman walked up to Thomas E. Miller, that was the black senator's name, pointed his finger in his face, and he said, you big black rascal, you, I understand that you made some uncomplimentary remarks about me during my absence. And I want to tell you right now, if I ever hear of you making any more uncomplimentary remarks about me, I'll swallow you alive. And Thomas Miller pointed his finger in the face of Ben Tillman and said, yeah, and if you do, you'll have more brains in your belly than you got in your head. <laughs> Mason Brewer believed that folklore helped us better appreciate and understand each other. This, of course, stemmed from his deep belief in the dignity and brotherhood of all mankind. I heard a wonderful sermon about three or four years ago, and it impressed me very much. And the title of the sermon was, I am Joseph, your brother. And so I went home and wrote this little poem. I'm Joseph, your brother. My skin is black, I live in a shack by the railroad track. And you call me Sam, but that ain't who I am. I'm Joseph, your brother. I works downtown, it's a new compound. It's where I buckles down. And you call me George and lots of other hard parts. But I'm Joseph, your brother. I pays my church dues and I sings the blues. I eat my collard greens, fat back red beans and stews. And you call me nigger, but that don't figure. Cause I'm Joseph, your brother. My soul is tired, but heavenly fired and God inspired. Yet you called me Tom and do's me harm. But I'm still Joseph, your brother. Dr. J. Mason Brewer was a unique individual. He'd probably deny that, saying that anyone could do what he did if they just stuck to it. He believed that strongly, and it is that spirit which inspired others. He did a lot. He was author of seven collections on folklore and one on black Texas history, and his writings appear in more than 15 anthologies. He wrote numerous articles and welcomed speaking engagements from small churches to major American universities. Toward the end of his life, his contributions and vision began to be recognized. When he died in 1975 at the age of 78, he was working on yet another manuscript. In his writing, collecting, and teaching, he'd helped preserve a vital part of our American tradition. Equally important, he exemplified through his life the ideals and tenacity of one who would not be deterred by his critics. He was, as he would put it, following his own star. Each era in history produces its own folklore, and folklore is being created right today. You can take the elderly blacks who talk about the income taxes and the form of rhymes. The more you make, the more they take. <laughs> I used to work for myself where I am, but now I work for Uncle Sam. <laughs> And that reflects what's happening in our society today. We have space jokes and new types of songs being created daily and circulated orally. And you know, folklore uh, belongs to oral tradition. And it must be circulated and passed on from one person to the other. What the crookedest road you see? I see a road so crooked till the gnat broke his neck going round the curve. What the tallest man you ever see? The tallest man I ever seen was getting a hair cut in heaven and a shoe shine in hell. <laughs> what the runnest car you ever see? The runnest car I ever see was my uncle's old car. 
He'd run over Monday, kill Tuesday, send Wednesday to the hospital, cripple up Thursday, and told Friday to tell Saturday to be at the funeral Sunday at 4 o'clock. Well, uh, I thank you very much for asking me, sir. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure.